Ah, c'est déjà là. Ok. Okay. So, hello everyone. C can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for being here. Uh, I hope you are enjoying your Android Maker so far. Uh, I would like to thank Android Makers for inviting me because it was not initially planned. So, my name is uh, Christophe Bales. I'm a freelance mobile developer from Belgium. And this morning, we are going to talk about Kotlin and Java bytecode. So there are actually three talks about bytecode this year, I see, um, including this one. So hopefully, this one is going to be a bit more accessible. Well, at, at least I will try to keep you entertained. So first, I want to start with a confession. I really didn't take any interest in Kotlin until Google announced the official support for Kotlin at Google I.O. in 2017. And uh, then I just took a look at it. I, I took a look at the documentation, and I found it really interesting. The, the documentation was really well made. And uh, I, I learned Kotlin by just testing all the language features by writing some sample code. And then, uh, because I'm really interested, into, uh, I'm really interested uh, in performance, I uh, <coughs> I tried to decompile the code uh, and look at um, how features are actually implemented. Because as you may know, uh, for the JVN compiler, Kotlin is actually generating Java 6 compatible bytecode. So I decided to learn by writing uh, a few uh, blog posts on Medium. And uh, I, uh, as I was learning, I, I published uh, more parts. And I was really not expecting to, to have a lot of popularity with this blog post. I was just uh, doing this my, uh, for myself. And then I was really surprised to see that I was actually uh, mentioned by the master himself. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, actually, my, my, the, the, the title of my blog post is uh, Exploring Kotlin's Hidden Costs. And uh, Mr. Jack Wharton made a presentation called Exploring uh, Java's Hidden Costs. So I wanted to do the same thing, basically. So overnight, I went from uh, Kotlin beginner to Kotlin expert, <laughs> even though I think I have uh, much, I, I've written much less uh, Kotlin code than many people in this room. So this is what we are going to talk about today. So I'm going to base this presentation on the blog post, but it's going to be a, a little bit updated because things have changed in the last year. So this is the agenda of the presentation. So first, I'm going to explain what uh, Kotlin hidden costs. Then we are going to explore uh, various lang uh, Kotlin language features, uh, not all of them, obviously, but the ones I found interesting. And then we are going to end the presentation with a small word about benchmarks. So what's a hidden cost? Uh, it's simply a hidden performance penalty of some Kotlin construct that you don't immediate, immediately see in the Kotlin code. So if you don't see uh, this penalty in the Kotlin code, where do you see it? Well, you see it by looking at the Java bytecode. So this means that we are going to focus on the JVM implementation of Kotlin, and not uh, on Kotlin native or Kotlin JavaScript. And uh, this is the one that's uh, used for Android as well, of course. So uh, there are three main types of costs. Uh, the first kind, uh, which is uh, actually omnipresent, is the boxing of primitive types. So I hope you're all familiar with uh, what uh, boxing is. So it's mainly when you have a, a primitive value like int and you need to convert it to an object, usually temporarily. Um, and this induces, of course, mem memory allocations and stuff. So the second kind of cost is uh, when Kotlin will generate a temporary uh, hidden object. And the third kind is when the Kotlin compiler will uh, generate extra methods 
uh, which is uh, important for Android because we try to limit the number of methods in our DEX files. Even though we have multi-DEX today, it's still, uh, it's still a good idea to limit the, the, the number of methods. So first, don't be paranoid. Uh, Kotlin mostly does the right thing by default, so there are many things I'm not going to talk about today, and you can assume that they are really optimized and safe, and you don't need to worry about them. So here is a simple example. Uh, this is probably one of the simplest code example you can write in Kotlin. It's just a simple top-level field in a, in a Kotlin file. And then after you write this, uh, you can open in Android Studio uh, the, the Show Kotlin Bytecode panel. And this will actually show you the Java bytecode. But there is also a little decompile button at the top, which is uh, very handy to see the Java representation of it. So here's what it looks like. Every time we are going to show the bytecode representation sorry, of the Kotlin code, uh, the slides are going to turn dark, so you know that you're in the bytecode world. But don't be afraid, I will not uh, bother you with uh, bytecode. Uh, I will try to show you the Java representation most of the time, which is much more readable. Well, even on that screen, it's a bit difficult, but I hope it will be readable enough. So as you can see, when you create a a simple top-level field, it's going to create an intermediate class with a static field and a static getter method. Now, let's deep dive into the cut-in features. So we'll start with the companion object. So as you know, in Kotlin, there, there is no static fields or methods. So instead, we can use top-level fields like I just shown or we can use objects. So there are two kinds of objects, the regular objects and the companion objects. And objects are actually singletons. So when, uh, in the case of companion objects, uh, what's interesting to know is that, just like in Java actually for inner classes, the class and the companion objects are actually compiled to two separate objects, so two separate classes. So this means that if the fields are private or protected inside the, the main class or the companion object, the other party uh, cannot access the field directly. So the compiler needs to generate uh, synthetic uh, static accessor methods so that you, uh, the, the object can access the, the, the field in the other part. So this means more methods in our uh, DEX files. And uh, in Java, you could mitigate that by using the package visibility, but in Kotlin, we don't have that. So here is a simple example, uh, just a simple companion object inside a class and a main method which is trying to read the, the field inside the companion object, and it's uh, declared as private. And if we decompile that, well, if you look, we look at the bytecode, we can see that this is actually pretty inefficient. So our main method is at the bottom here, and the field we are trying to access is at the very top. And in order to access it, it's actually going through three extra methods. So the compiler is adding three methods for each field, and uh, every time you're trying to read the field, it's going to do three chained method calls. And another thing that is worth uh, noting here is that the, the field that we declared inside the companion object is actually stored inside the outer class in the bytecode. So why does it do that? Well, it's because the, the, the method at the bottom is trying to access the getter in the companion object, but because the getter is private, it needs to go through a synthetic accessor method, the first one. And then the getter is actually trying to read the field, but the field is not stored inside the companion object, it's stored inside the unclosing class. So because that field is also private, it needs to go through another synthetic accessor method. So that was really bad. Uh, I found uh, that surprising, knowing that in uh, this, the Java world you just have to a single static access for, uh, for the constants. But the good news is that last week, uh, there was a new release of Kotlin uh, compiler, and it's fixed now. So now, it's just reading the fields directly, and the companion object here is basically not used. So uh, the, the method is reading the fields directly inside the enclosing class. But the irony is that 
if the companion object tries to read the field from, uh, from uh, one of its own fields, uh, because the field is actually stored in the enclosing class, it will still have, uh, it still has to go through another synthetic accessor, accessor method. So it's a, a bit counterintuitive. You, you think that you're accessing your own field, but actually the field is not stored in the companion object. So if you want to avoid these, uh, these uh, uh, synthetic accessor methods in general, what you can do is to use the count keyword. So I recommend that every time you have a constant, uh, if it's a string or a primitive in, because you can't use it for other types, uh, always use const. And when you do that, it's going to inline the value at the call site. So it's a bit like the inline keyword for functions, but for uh, static fields, uh, constant fields. So here there is no cost. Uh, another alternative is uh, to use uh, top level fields, like I mentioned. So what you can do is inside a class, you can declare the field at the top as private. Sorry, I mean inside a file. And if you declare the field as private, then it's going to be accessible for all the classes in that file, but not for the classes outside of that file. And when you do that, it's actually going to generate, again, one single accessor method because the field is private and it's inside a, an extra class. But still, it's, it's, it's mostly okay, mostly okay. So now let's move on to something a bit more interesting, the higher order functions and the lambda expressions. So a higher order function is simply a function taking one or more functions as arguments or returning one. So here is a simple example. It's just, uh, I think it, there is an equivalent uh, code in the Android KTX extension library. So it's just a function uh, performing a transaction and the body of the transaction is actually uh, a function passed as argument. And as you can see, it's uh, taking a database as uh, argument and returning an int. So when we need to call that uh, higher order function, we have a syntax like that. And here we have a lambda expression. So the lambda expression is actually the function. So how are um, lambda, uh, or what's the implement implementation of lambdas in Kotlin? Because as you know, lambdas are not supposed to be supported by Java 6. Well, Kotlin simply, the Kotlin compiler simply generates a class, a function class, actually. So it's a new object with a few methods in it. Each lambda expression that you write in your code are actually uh, adding one class and three or four methods to the total um, methods count of your application. Uh, but the good news is that the instances are only created when necessary. So. If you have a capturing lambda, which means a lambda that is accessing uh, variables outside of the scope of the lambda, then um, there will be a new instance every time you call the higher order function. So there will be a new temporary object for the function, and then it's going to be garbage collected. But if you are, if you are using a non-capturing lambda, like in the example here, then a singleton instance of the function will be used and reused. So, here is the bytecode rep representation of the method call, and you can see that we are actually uh, using a single term. Uh, yeah, so, so you can see that the, um, the function object is actually implementing an interface, in this case, function one. And uh, contrary to Java uh, 8, the function interfaces in Kotlin are non-specialized, so they are generic which means they are all taking objects as inputs and returning objects. And because this is the type that is going to be exposed, this means that there will be boxing. So in this case, we see that the actual implementation is at the bottom and it's, using a it's returning a primitive int, but the, the function object uh, adds another method to actually implement the interface, the generic interface. And this one, as you can see, uh, is performing boxing. So it will unbox and box the values of the bottom function. So if you want to avoid these costs, so the new function instanti instantiation and the boxing, you can use inline. So this is my favorite uh, Kotlin feature. So when you use inline, 
then your function is going to be turned into some kind of macro. So the whole body of the function is going to be copied at the core site. So in this case, here's what the method call looks like now. So it's actually the method itself. And the lambda, uh, the, so the function and the lambda expression has been directly copied into the, the call site as well, and there is no boxing. So in summary, when you use inline, you have no instantiation of function objects, you have no boxing, and you have actually no uh, function call, so it's actually faster. But of course, there are also downsides. So you cannot call these functions recursively. Uh, a public inline function can only access the public members of the class, and it will grow the code size because it's going to copy the function itself at every call site. So when you are using inline, uh, so when you are using higher order functions, sorry, you should use inline when possible, but keep your inline functions short. Uh, because, uh, well, uh, especially if you are having inline functions calling inline functions, calling other, other inline functions, then your code size may uh, explode. So you, you really have to be careful about that. And one thing you can do is you can decompose your function into smaller functions that are not inline to make the to control the code size, the code grow. And in other cases where you can't use inline, then you can uh, you should prefer non-capturing lambdas to avoid method allocations, uh, function object allocations. Sorry. So now let's talk briefly about local functions. So it's just a function inside another function, something you can't do in Java. Uh, and as you can see in this example, we are accessing the outer scope. We are accessing a variable from the outer function in the inner function. And uh, the bad thing about these local functions is that you can't declare them inline. So basically, if you take a look at the bytecode, they are implemented similarly to the lambda expression, the higher order function, sorry. So the, the local function is also a function object. And because it's capturing in this case, it's going to instantiate a new one every time you call the outer function. But if you take a look at the function call here, the local function call at the bottom, uh, it's interesting to note that the compiler is actually calling the specialized uh, invoke, uh, taking a primitive integer. So there will actually be no boxing in this case because the type is private to the function, so it's not exposed to the outside world, so it can optimize it and just call the primitive one. So if you want to avoid uh, the, the overhead of allocating this uh, function object, you can again use non-capturing uh, local functions, but then, so this is the same function rewritten as uh, non-capturing, but then it's, uh, you may argue that you're uh, losing the main uh, benefit of using uh, local functions, so it may not be what you want. Now, let's talk about Varag. So in, uh, in Kotlin, just like in Java, you can call functions um, and pass a variable number of arguments to it. And if you if you call that function, you have actually three, three ways to call the function. So the first way is to just pass the individual values. And if you take a look at the bytecode, it's going to allocate an array with all values. But in Java, it's exactly the same thing. You have the same cost. The second way to call the var function is passing an array directly. But in Kotlin, you need to use the spread operator. And actually, when you use that operator, it's going to copy your array, your original array. So this is different from Java. In Java, you, when you pass an array to a var function, it's just using the original array. But here, it's going to make a copy. Why is it doing that? Probably to, to make sure your code is safe and will not be impacted by changes uh, at the call site or things like that. And there is also a third way to to call a var function in Kotlin, you can mix uh, individual, individual values and arrays. So if you do that, 
then it's going to allocate a special object called int spread builder because in this case it's an int, an int array. And also it's going to make an array copy. So it's a slightly bigger cost. So this is all fine, but if you have performance critical code where you need to call that varac function with an array repeatedly, then I would recommend that you create another version of the function which is just taking, a, taking an array as argument so it's not, it will not be making a copy. Now let's talk about null safety. This wonderful picture is supposed to represent the difference between uh, zero and null. <laughs> so, uh, as you may know, in Kotlin we have null, um, sorry, we have um, non-nullable types and uh, we have null safety. So by default when you declare this method, the, the argument who is here is uh, actually not null. And when you compile uh, a function with a non-null uh, argument, it's actually going to insert uh, a check at the, uh, the beginning of your function. So it's going to check if the argument is actually not null or throw an exception. An exception. It's going to do that for the public functions, but not for the private ones, because the compiler can guarantee that inside the Kotlin file, everything is null safe. <coughs> so this, uh, this is a very fast check. It's a static method call, but still, uh, yeah, so for every, for every argument, you're gonna have this call, of course. So this is very fast and the performance is neg negligible, but still, if you are, are really uh, into performance and you want to optimize every little bit of your application, you can actually optionally disable this for release builds. I would not recommend that you disable that for debug builds. If you want to do that, you can actually add a uh, compiler argument in your build.gradle file for Android. This is the method I recommend. Only for the release builds, as you can see. Or there is another way. You can also use uh, Gradle, uh, sorry, uh, ProGuard. And if you use ProGuard, you can add a ProGuard rule to remove the, these checks. So simi similarly to, the, to when you want to remove uh, log calls using ProGuard. But this will only work if you are using a non-optimizing uh, ProGuard rules set. So if you have don't optimize in your rules, it will not work. Now, it's also important to think about the types that you are using in your code to avoid boxing. So as you know, uh, in Kotlin, there is no uh, distinction between the primitive int and the integer array like there is in Java. In Kotlin, you just have int. And when you compile that, um, the compiler is going to be smart and is going to use the primitive int when possible. Uh, in some cases, it's going to use integer because you have no choice, you need to do boxing, uh, like I've shown in the previous examples. But if you use a nullable int, then it's never going to be compiled to a primitive int, so you will always have boxing. So this seems obvious, but still needs to be reminded. Also, um, talking about arrays, if you use the generic array of int, even if it's a primitive int, uh, a non-nil int, sorry, uh, it's going to generate an array of objects. So you have to use the specialized array types in Kotlin like int array or float array to uh, end up with uh, specialized, uh, sorry, with primitive um, arrays with no boxing. Now let's talk about delegated properties quickly. So this is, a, this is a simple example of a delegate proper, delegated property. I'm not going to, into the details of uh, what it does. I, I, I assume that everybody is familiar with it. So when you write a delegate, it's actually going to add quite a lot of code. So there is a lot of metadata about your delegates uh, in the class. And then it's going to add a, an extra getter and setter method if it's a var or just a getter if it's a val. So this is not a lot, but it can grow up quickly. So for example, let's say you have a, an activity with, uh, where you declare six views and you bind the views using a, 
cutter knife like uh, delegated property, for example, then you're going to end up here with six delegate instances and six private getter methods added to your DEX file. So if you really want to optimize that, you can also try to avoid uh, creating new uh, delegates because the delegates are also objects, of course. And uh, you, you can do that when your delegate is uh, uh, stateless and when it doesn't require any argument. So if you want to reuse a delegate, you can uh, implement the delegate uh, as an object and reuse it. It's going to be a single term. Uh, or you can, you can also extend existing objects so, to make them delegates. So for example, you can, uh, also add, you, you can also use extension functions to existing types and they will become delegates. So uh, you may know that, but in the Kotlin standard library, the map and mutable map are actually implemented as delegates. So you can use a hash map as a delegate out of the box and uh, the key of the hash map is going to be the field name and the value is going to be the the field value. Also good to know, if you are creating a generic delegate, then it, there's gonna be boxing. So uh, if you want to avoid that, so, so here we have a simple example where we have a, a share preference delegate, which is storing a long value, uh, but if it's a, a generic one, it's going to box the long, or unbox it when you read it. So you should, uh, if you really want to optimize things, you, you should create specialized delegate classes for each primitive type that you are using. And finally, um, there are a few built-in delegates in uh, the standard library. And one of the most useful ones is lazy. Uh, to do uh, uh, initialization, initialization, sorry, the first time you are reading a field. And uh, if you don't pass any argument to lazy, is going to actually use double checked locking every time you are read, reading the fields, which is kind of expensive. So if you know that you are reading the field always from the main thread, for example in, in Android, then you can safely use the safely pass the argument lazy thread safety mode dot none, and then it's going to uh, do no locking at all. Let's talk about ranges. So, ranges are used to uh, represent a finite set of values in Kotlin, and the main operator function to create a range is the dot dot function. So here is a simple example to simply check if a value is between one and 10. And when you compile that, it's going to be super optimized, no cost, everyone's happy. We can also do that for uh, classes implementing comparable, like string, for example. And uh, so here we are testing if a word is between two other words in the dictionary. And this used to have a cost. When I wrote uh, the articles initially, uh, it was generating a range object, a temporary object. But now it's uh, optimized as well, just using compare to two times, since Kotlin 1.1.50. So that's great. Uh, still, it's worth noting that if you are, uh, if you have an indirection, for example, you are uh, returning a range from for a, from a function or from a property, then the compiler is still going to generate an object. So it's allocating a Specially, specialized range object, but at least there is no boxing because it's an int range. So you should you declare the ranges directly in the, in the test where they are used, when you can, or declare them as constants so there, there is no uh, repeated allocations. And uh, also noting if you, if you declare that function here uh, as inline, it will not change anything, so it will also allocate an int range. So the second use of ranges is to iterate, of course. So here is a simple example where we iterate from one to 10. Again, when we compile, this is super optimized, no cost. Uh, 
You can also iterate backwards using down to. Again, if you use down to function, it's going to be optimized, no cost. But before, when you use until, it was actually uh, generating a, a, a range function, a range object, sorry. And this has been fixed in Kotlin 1.1.4. So before, I was actually recommending people not to use until and to use instead dot dot size minus one. But now it's, uh, as you can see, the code is uh, just as good as in Java. So feel free to use it. Now, when you use two or more functions to create a range, for example, here we are using the dot dot function plus step or plus reverse. So the, the second example is actually doing the same thing as the the past example we down to, but in a more original way, let's say. If you do that, then the compiler is always going to generate uh, progression objects, which are, which is the, the interface for ranges to do the iteration. So in this case, we're, this is the, the bytecode of the of that function here at the bottom, with uh, reverse. So it's going to uh, instantiate these two ranges, objects, and then iterate on them. But at least there is no boxing. Kotlin also has built-in indices, extension properties for arrays and uh, collections, uh, so classes implementing the collection interface. And when you iterate on indices, again, the, the bytecode is uh, also optimized, it's not generating any temporary object but it doesn't work if you roll your own. So if you create your own indices property, for example, for a class that doesn't implement coll uh, collection, then it's not going to work. It's going to, uh, to um, instantiate a new object. Also, I've seen people using this to iterate. I don't know why you would want to do that. Maybe if you are a fan of JavaScript. Uh, so this is an original way. It works, but it's absolutely not efficient. So this is an, an extension uh, function, and it's inline, so it's supposed to be fast, but actually, no, it's not fast, because it's going to create an int range, and then it's going to create an iterator object again, and then it's going to, for every iteration, it's going to call has next and next int. So there are two extra method calls. So it's not a big deal, but if you do that in a loop, or in a nested loop, then of course it's going, to, it's going to be way, way slower than a simple uh, for loop. So prefer the for loop when you can, and prefer using a single function call to dot dot down to or until which are optimized to create the range. Or you can also use the built-in indices property on arrays and collection classes, but don't create your own. It's better than you just use the until with the, the size. Now, this is a bonus. This is not in the original articles I wrote. It's about the when function. Sorry, the when operator. So, the when is like a superpowered switch statement for, for Kotlin. It's really cool. Uh, this is a very simple example where we are using when uh, like a switch on a list of int values. And when you compile that, it's going to generate the equivalent of a Java switch. So what's interesting is that the switch is actually a bytecode operation called table switch, which is a very efficient way to compare an integer against multiple integer values. So this is also used for a switch on strings. So when you are using a switch on a string, it's going to actually uh, compute the hash, uh, the hash code of the string and do a table switch on the hash code. So this is very fast. So it does exactly the same thing as Java, but uh, when is much more flexible. So you can actually mix and match simple cases and tests. So this is equivalent to the code I shown on the previous slide. It's doing the same thing, but here we have a, a range check mixed with the other cases. And as soon as you uh, add something that is not a simple uh, list of values in your when statement, then the compiler cannot optimize that to a table switch. So 
is going to be transformed to a, a list of if else block. So if you really sorry, if you really care about performance here, you can what you can do is if you have a lot of cases and one of the cases is not a simple list, you can put that in the else statement and do another uh, another when there. And then the first one is going to use table switch, the second one is not. Now let's talk about benchmarks. Uh, I didn't talk about benchmarks in my articles, but sure, sure enough, a few days after I published my blog post, someone thought it would be a good idea to do benchmarks. And I was actually not really happy with that article. Um, so it's a, this article actually took my oversimplified examples and turned them into benchmarks for the JVM, for the desktop and server. Uh, what I didn't like about this article is that it was passing the wrong message. So I know that people like simple answers, like should I use that, yes or no, but simple answers are often not correct answers. The, the right answer would be it depends. And uh, yeah, in this article, the conclusion was just a list of check marks and crosses to say if you should or shouldn't use the Kotlin feature based on the benchmark results, which is, of course, a BS view. And the other thing I didn't like about the article is the methodology of the benchmarks. So I could spend hours talking about micro benchmarks and why they are mostly flawed. But uh, I will show you a little example uh, why the, the I, I don't think the benchmark were actually benchmarking the right thing, not measure, measuring the right thing. So this is the, the cutting code to benchmark the overhead of uh, of calling a higher order function. So if you remember what I said at the beginning of the talk, what are the two costs when you call a lambda, a higher order function and you pass a lambda uh, without using inline? Well, the first cost is the function object allocation when you have a capturing lambda. So in my article, I actually illustrated uh, the non-capturing lambda to show you that it's going to reuse the same instance of the function object. But here, in the benchmark, if you want to show that there is a cost, you have to benchmark a capturing lambda, but it's not what is done in the benchmark. So you are not measuring that, measuring that cost. And the other cost is the boxing. So our method is returning an int, and if we want to measure the overhead of the boxing to integer, we need to, to return a, a different in the same uh, a different int uh, for each uh, method call. So if we take a look at the implementation, the dummy implementation of the database object in the benchmark, the delete uh, method is actually returning zero. So it's always returning the same value, which means that the the JVM may optimize that, and also it's inside the integer cache. So you may know that in Java there is actually a cache for small int values so that there will, be, there will be no memory allocation for this value. So we are not measuring any real impact here. So sure enough, <laughs> uh, the day after, someone else posted another set of benchmarks, but this time for Android. So it was reusing the same code, but testing that on Android phone. This is actually the same benchmark on the left side, it's on the JVM desktop, and on the right side, it's on Android. I think it's Art, uh, Android 5. And on the left side, the conclusion was there is no difference. And on the right side, the conclusion is it's 60, 60 times slower. So what can you conclude from these numbers? Basically, nothing. Uh, <laughs> so this means that, yeah, we are, we are not uh, it's it's uh, useless to do a benchmark if you don't know your target platform and your target code. So we, one thing worth mentioning also is that the memory consumption was never mentioned in the benchmark. So it was just about el elapsed time. But if you end up with a lot of memory allocated, this is also a cost because this memory will have to be garbage collected eventually. And also, yeah, the, the negative impacts are amplified when you are uh, writing nested loops and things like that. 
And of course, the, perform the performance varies greatly per platform. So you have the JVM for the desktop and server, but you also have Android. And then on Android, you have Dalvik, and you have Art, and you have a lot of different versions of Art. And each version has its own different optimizations. So there are no, no simple answers, and if you really want to know if there is an impact, you should not prematurely optimize, but if you want to, then you have to profile your own code on your own target platform. So thank you very much. I hope you found that interesting. If you have any questions. <laughs>